There's one moment in Game of Thrones which forcibly rejects any notion that this story is normal, and fans of the series will know exactly which moment I'm talking about. It's the point where, you know, the God of Death realizes that he's accidentally let Sean Bean have more than 30 minutes of airtime. I'm of course referring to the moment when Ned Stark, Hand of the King, Lord of Winterfell, and arguably THE main character is executed in the Westeros equivalent of a kangaroo court. Fans were shocked. I mean, it's a pretty well crystallized trope in fiction that no matter how hairy the situation gets, the main character is going to end up fine. In fact, this is so prevalent that Archer's titular character constantly references the fact that nothing ever seems to go wrong for him. I mean, things go wrong, but never actually really wrong. In fact, more than once on the show, he's explicitly insisted that he's effectively invincible. This phenomenon goes by a whole bunch of different names, but it's most commonly referred to as plot armor. But it seems like Ned Stark sort of had a pretty big chink in the whole, um, back of the neck area. With Ned dead, fans started trying to identify his narrative heir apparent, the real main character of the series. But George R. R. Martin has made it abundantly, if not brutally clear, that no one is safe from the icy clutches of death. Well, I mean, provided that you aren't killed by the icy clutches of the White Walkers, but still. It seems like he's taken Faulkner's famous advice for fiction writers to quote, murder your darlings a bit too literally. With the depth of the world and the sheer number of deaths in it, and after all of the investment, investigations, and heartbreak, fans started to conclude that only George R. R. Martin knows who the main character is. If there's even one at all, it's impossible for us mere mortals to figure it out. But what if it wasn't? What if we could know, and pretty definitively too, who the most important characters in the Game of Thrones universe are? Well, it turns out that we can, and we could do so with math. I know that it may seem a bit odd to analyze art with mathematics, but there's actually a pretty nifty technique that social scientists use to understand the underlying complexity of social systems, and it's called graph theory. When we think of graphs, we tend to think back to things like this from our algebra classes. It usually had some sort of line running through it defined by some mathematical function. They were usually pretty simple, but they could get intense. No, I mean really intense. Although this may be the first thing that springs to mind, graph theory is actually quite different. First off, forget the whole x and y coordinate deal. It makes no difference if the points were shuffled over here, or here, or even here. Location has no bearing in graph theory. What matters instead are the connections between these points. Each point in graph theory is called a node, and it could basically stand in for whatever concept you'd like. Let's say that you want it to be US states, and let's just keep it at the original 13 for the sake of ease. Whereas on a map you have to have 13 objectively weird shapes just sort of slapped into each other, in graph theory you instead have 13 simple nodes. What if we want to see which states border each other? Well, then we'd have to start drawing in lines that connect the points together, and we'd call these lines edges. Each edge signifies the existence of a border between two states. So North Carolina's node has edges that connect it to South Carolina, Georgia, and Virginia's, since if we look back on the map, North Carolina borders all of these states. We don't necessarily have to be limited to states, borders, or even geography. Nicholas Miller used it in the 1970s, for instance, as a way to articulate theories of voting. Stephen Ramsey used it to plot out Shakespeare's plays in order to create an algorithm that would determine whether or not a work was a tragedy or a comedy based upon how the scenes change location. And sociology uses it quite frequently in order to map out interpersonal connections. In fact, it's the same sort of thing that I outlined in the Your Facebook Friends Have More Friends Than You Do video, and it's the same general idea behind how researchers Andrew Beveridge and Jai Shan were finally able to determine who the main characters of Game of Thrones are. Their insight was to realize that the main characters are more than just the people who the story rotated around, they were also the individuals who had the most connections to the work's other characters. To use Harry Potter as an example, Harry, Ron, and Hermione meet just about every single character that crops up over the seven books, but there are loads of characters who never actually meet each other. Therefore, they are the main characters as opposed to, say, Seamus, because they have the connections to way more people and events throughout the series. Of course, the Song of Ice and Fire is a bit more fleshed out than Harry Potter, making the total number of connections a bit more intense, but the general idea still applies. Assign each character in Westeros an individual node, outline all the connections that they are shown to have in the story, wait them out to account for family and whatnot, then have the computer add up all of the edges to figure out which node has the most. Since the television series is still ongoing and the next book hasn't been released yet, despite the fact that it's been promised to us already, the researchers decided to do the analysis on book three. And since, you know, I guess the Red Wedding is a way to, <clears throat> uh, thin, thin the herd, I mean, jeez. That's hard to joke about, man. That was just brutal. Just, yeah. Anyways, after doing this analysis, the researchers came up with three main contenders for the title of main character in the series. 
Jon Snow, Daenerys Targaryen, and Tyrion Lannister. And if you think about it, this definitely makes sense considering how much time we spend in those characters' headspace. It's not like we get to understand all the subtleties underlying Rickon's actions, for God's sake. Plus, most of the overarching plot points involve them directly, including some of the more spectacular fan theories floating about out there. Or, you know, maybe I'm just using this as a way to justify and rationalize away what happened to Jon Snow at the end of the last season. I mean, that's admittedly also possible. So, there you have it. We've learned through connections and graphs that if you're going to have a bet based on who's going to end up on the Iron Throne at the end of the series, your money is best placed on Jon, Tyrion, or Daenerys. Although, I'd personally be lying if I said that I didn't have a special place in my heart for Hodor. Hold on. What do you guys think? Is Jon, Daenerys, or Tyrion the main character, or characters? Do you even think there are any main characters at all in this series? And what do you think of Graf's Theory's ability to be able to pierce through this whole heaping ton of narrative complexity? Let me know in the comments, and I'll be replying to some of the new ones in two weeks during office hours. Links for everything will be down in the doobly-doo in case you guys want to read up on some of this stuff. It's really, really interesting. And if you enjoyed this video, I hope that you'll consider liking it and subscribing to the channel. As always, Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.